Welcome to another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. Got an amazing guest for us here today, Will Martin of Iris. Will, how are you doing today? I'm great, Mike. Great to be here. Uh, it's always great to connect. Um, really, really pleased to, to get a chance to speak with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Apologize in advance for the audience. My voice is a little crackly today. Sound like I'm going through puberty. I'm kind of on the tail end of a, a, a cold, but uh, didn't want to make the, miss the opportunity to have a conversation with Will and, and, and dive into the exciting things that you guys have going on at Iris. Uh, really was looking forward to this conversation. For those of you that don't know, um, I've known Will for quite some time now, I've done a lot of business together and followed his career closely as he's moved through many different startup organizations and now is uh, is leading a, a really exciting technology a company with a, a fascinating technology in the critical care space when you made this move this was an interesting one from afar because you had such a so much domain expertise and subject matter expertise in, in vascular and interventional previously I'd love to have you just kind of give a little brief overview of who Iris is and kind of what drew you into to the organization. What was compelling about the opportunity for you? Yeah, thanks, Mike. We've known each other for some time and have uh, crossed paths and, and you've you've played a, a role in uh, success of a number of my previous startups by helping us tell the story and bring the right members onto the team. This is an evolution that, that I really enjoy talking about. Uh, my Medical device career primarily was focused on vascular, peripheral vascular, spending time launching products into to, to the cath lab. My three previous startups were all focused in and around the interventional suites and the startup world at Access Closure, uh, where we had the Minx vascular closure device and got a chance to interact with some unbelievable people that have been great mentors for me. Uh, you know, Fred Kashravi, who's now the CEO of Imperative Care, Leslie Trigg, who's the CEO of Outset Medical, a couple of companies doing amazing things in the world of stroke and, and dialysis, uh, dialysis care. I got bit by the startup bug at Access Closure, was fortunate enough to, to move on to another one of the portfolio companies there uh, within the, the incubator, uh, Hotspur Technologies. When we exited that uh, to Teleflex, then moved over to another peripheral vascular startup, Athromed, which ultimately ended up being acquired by Philips Volcano. So as I moved through my career, through those, those vascular startups, taking on more responsibility and expanding my base of knowledge, uh, I thought back to some of those early conversations that I had about evolution of, of one skill set and you know, wanting to, to be driven to get out of bed every day and do something special. And um, for me, I, I was running the peripheral vascular division at Philips. Uh, we had just acquired Spectronetics. Uh, we were doing really well. It was an unbelievable time and could have had a, a long, comfortable uh, career at Philips. They, they take great care of their people. But it was time for me to get uncomfortable again. And the world of peripheral vascular, from my perspective, had gotten a little crowded. And I wanted to go build something from scratch again. And as I spent more time here in San Diego, I got introduced to uh, my predecessor, Dr. Cleanthus Santhopoulos, who was the CEO of Iris at the time. And he introduced me to the world of neurocritical care. I'd spent a lot of time in neurovascular, chasing clot into the brain to help patients with ischemic stroke. But it was eye-opening for me that patients who had ruptured aneurysms, who had intracranial bleeding or hemorrhagic stroke, still were, were treated with antiquated technology. And as I looked to essentially take the next step in my career to move to the CEO level, as I took just an inventory of things, I thought it was a great opportunity to, to step into a new challenge, just jump right into the deep end of the pool and prove to myself that, that I could do similar things in a completely new clinical space. And so over the last four plus years here at Iris, has it been four already? Yeah, yeah. It's joined in uh, early part of 2018. You know, that's what happens when two years are just cannibalized by a pandemic. <laughs> right. Well said. We've been working hard to, to revolutionize how patients in the neuro, neurosurgical intensive care unit are treated. And, and that's what ultimately drew me to Iris, the, the chance to help patients who have no other option with new technology and completely flip a space upside down and, and redefine it by bringing 21st century technology into how these patients are treated. And that's what we're doing every day here with our Iroflow system. 
Yeah. I don't think we've ever talked about that transition. While it seems like a radical shift, it's really not that radical when you consider that you were treating stroke patients and I would say even more than tangential, it's kind of directly correlated. So it, it does make it does make sense. There's definitely an overlap, but it's the, the neuro ICU is completely different than neuroradiology or the cath lab in terms of how the patients are treated and, and how you have to bring a product to market. You know, for me also, there was, there was a, a work-life balance component to it. My family and I at the time were living in North Carolina. When Athermed was acquired I, and I took over the business unit, I was flying to San Diego twice a week to run a business and to fly to a desk. I wasn't going to visit customers anymore. And my sons were getting ready to start elementary school. And it was time for me, if I knew I wanted to take this step uh, into the CEO chair, it, it made sense to be in California to have more opportunity to do that. Thank goodness I did because we've been able to, to be together as a family during the pandemic without me having to worry about getting on a plane and, and flying and being gone for weeks at a time. So from a career perspective, but even more importantly, from a family perspective, my, my transition to Iris uh, has been the best thing I've done in my career. Yeah. It's neat to hear you talk about that because, you know, a lot of leaders get really wrapped up in the journey of their career, right? Aren't they always able to keep that balance with family and, and all the other things that play into our lives that are important to us? And usually when I talk to leaders that make decisions that incorporate those aspects, they're usually pretty good ones. They play out better than if you're just singularly focused on, I've got to get this title or I've got to get this compensation package and I'll do whatever I've got to do to get it. There's usually, you know, cause I always tell people, I say, be careful about chasing money because if you chase money six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks into the job, once the newness, you know, once you've put that post on LinkedIn that I took this new splashy job and the newness of that paycheck being adjusted a couple thousand dollars a month has worn off you're stuck with that job and you got to do that job every day. So you really got to make sure that it's a fit both personally and professionally. So that's sounds like you've, you followed a pretty good uh, decision tree there. So you guys have two products right now, the Hummingbird and the, the era flow is, is seemingly the focus product here at present, right? Yes. So the, the company's founded on our Airflow system, which is the world's first intracranial uh, fluid management system that combines irrigation, needed fluid drainage, and intracranial pressure monitoring. So it, it takes a, a passive antiquated approach for these patients with, with elevated pressure and, and intracranial bleeding. You know, the current standard of care is just putting in a, a passive drain and letting gravity do its work, hoping that the drainage can keep the patient alive long enough for the body to break down the blood on its own through through enzymatic degradation. We're trying to take that with our airflow system into a proactive therapeutic approach where we're going in and irrigating and drainage to break up that clot and remove that toxic material more efficiently. So the company was founded based on that airflow system. And, and, it, and it cannibalizes a, uh, a large portion of our focus. Uh, in 2019, we opportunistically had the chance to acquire the, the assets of the Hummingbird family of intracranial pressure monitoring products. They're very complementary to what we're doing with Airflow. It gives us the opportunity to have a portfolio that not only diagnoses, but also uh, allows us to therapeutically treat patients with intracranial bleeding and traumatic brain injury. But definitely, you know, the Airflow product is, is more mature. The launch is progress farther. You know, we launched the full line of Hummingbird products here in the U.S. in January of 2020, so you know, right before the, the world <laughs> shut down. Uh, so we're playing catch up with that a little bit. But for a small company to have both complementary product lines, it, it helps us because we can target our approach to every customer. And when you're a single product company, you know, you've got one thing and... It's binary. It, exactly. So you know, if, if someone's not ready for the innovation that Airflow brings, you know, we can bring them other diagnostic tools to, to open the door, build a relationship and, and work in that direction. Yeah. Let's dig into this a little bit. For the audience out there that isn't familiar with this space, what what is the use case for? What's the problem Iraflow was was intended to solve and you know, and the challenges that are associated with that? The first thing that a neurosurgeon learns to do is place an external ventricular drain through what's called a ventriculostomy. Uh, so, using a a hand crank drill, they'll drill a, a hole in the skull. And using a, a, a needle and a catheter, uh, we'll place freehand a, a catheter, a drainage catheter. Just a silicone, simple drain, yeah. Just an extruded plastic tube, if you will, yep. with eight to 12 drainage holes at the tip of it. They'll place that blindly into the ventricle using anatomical 
Landmarks. Yeah, landmarks uh, for a roadmap. It's the first thing they learn. Uh, that treatment really is, is unchanged from a mechanism of action standpoint since it was first theorized in the 1700s. And the products that are the, the standard of care right now on the market by you know, the many of the large neurosurgical, neurocritical care companies have been on the market virtually unchanged uh, since the early 1980s. And so the sickest patients that a neurosurgeon will treat who have ruptured aneurysms, who have uh, conditions that will have 80 plus percent mortality. Traumatic brain injury falls into that. Traumatic brain injury, uh, ruptured aneurysms, subdural hematomas, all these various things. They're treated in an antiquated fashion. You put this drainage catheter in, it'll relieve the excess pressure that's building up within the skull and it's a wait and see approach to see how well the patient responds and how much time they're going to have in order to allow the body to, to break down that blood and give the patient a chance to respond. And you know, those, those ventricular drains, the passive ventricular drains, their shortcomings are well documented in literature. Because you're trying to remove blood clot, uh, they become clogged almost 50% of the time. You know, every time they become clogged, it requires external flushing and manipulation to restore drainage that's needed to keep this patient alive. And every time you have external manipulation, you increase the chance for secondary bleed, you increase the chance for infections, and, yeah. and it's just become a treatment situation where these shortcomings are now well accepted. And it's something that, that we as a company don't accept. And we're looking on a daily basis, not only to improve the opportunities for these patients, but then to, to shift it from that passive approach into a therapeutic one where we're aggressively trying to get that clot out in a matter of days as opposed to a matter of weeks. So when you say external manipulation, do they actually pull the catheter out, flush it, clean it, and then re-enter re it back into the drain? I mean, into the brain. Potentially. The first thing they'll do is a resident physician will come in and will try to manually flush the catheter. They'll take a syringe, they'll attach it to the drainage catheter, and they'll flush fluid trying to dislodge whatever is blocking the, the catheter, whether that's a clot with inside the catheter or clot that's adhered to the distal tip and is blocking the, the drainage holes. Oftentimes that flushing will work. Many times that flushing is required day after day after day. But every time you have that external interaction with the catheter, you increase the risk of bacteria introduction. And usually about one quarter of the time, those occluded catheters have to be replaced and a new one put in. That's interesting because, you know, when, when you start talking about infection and things like cardiac surgery and neurosurgery, it's, you know, an infection with an inguinal hernia where you've got, you know, polypropylene mesh. That's not fun, but it's not life, you know, life threatening. Typically, I got to think that's a paramount concern with the neurosurgeon, right? Huge concern increases the, the real, already real risk of morbidity and mortality, but it also extends the, the length of stay and in, it significantly increases the, the cost of care. A study published a couple years ago by the world-renowned team at Mount Sinai uh, Health in New York City showed that they had, I think it was an 11% infection rate. And every time uh, they had infection, it added 10 extra days in the ICU and $85,000 of added cost to the treatment. Now, talk about burden on the healthcare society uh, beyond what stroke already causes. You know, we, we've seen the last couple of years how important ICU bed space is, and for a essentially a an infection that's self-inflicted due to technology shortcomings, adding 10 extra days for someone to stay in the ICU, for us, that's not acceptable. And we're working day in and day out to address it. Yeah. Infection, just for re reference point to an 11% infection rate's astronomical. What's the standard infection rate in a hospital? What is it, like 2%? Somewhere in that range. Yeah. So that is markedly increased. And $85,000, my wife had a baby a couple months ago and, and looking at the hospital bill, mm -hmm. $85,000 for 10 days in the ICU seems light. Yeah, That seems very light, if I was being honest. I love this stuff. I, I'm a geek when it comes to technology, so I could pick your brain on it all day long. So what does Iraflow do differently mechanically? And then also how does it impact patient outcomes? We've already talked about, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the downsides of the current standard of care. Let's talk about how it affects patient outcomes and also how, how does it impact clinical workflows? Well, let's just start with the clinical workflow piece. The system itself, uh, the catheter is placed in a similar fashion. The first thing it does, it uses gravity to provide needed fluid drainage. You know, the, the fluid drainage 
drainage is what's keeping the patient alive. Uh, but what Iraflow does differently, it's got incorporated monitoring of the patient's intracranial pressure. So now treatment can be tailored based on the patient's condition. And as the condition of the patient evolves, then the system intelligently will tweak uh, the treatment that's provided. But really the secret that Iraflow adds is the third component, the recurring automated irrigation. So you know, I referenced the manual flushing that a resident will come in to do to try and restore patency to a catheter. Iraflow anywhere from every uh, 20 seconds to every three minutes, depending upon how often the surgeon and the clinical staff want to irrigate, uh, Iraflow will administer a bolus of, of irrigation. A bolus of irrigation, you know, a half a milliliter or one milliliter, and that bolus does two things. You know, the irrigation keeps the drainage holes free from blockage formation, but that small amount of fluid also helps to dilute the collected toxic material. You know, the catheter is generally placed directly into whatever toxic mass that needs to be removed, like a blood clot. The irrigation helps to, to dilute the surrounding material, keep the solid particulate in suspension, and uh, allows it to be more effectively uh, removed. And what we're now also seeing is that physicians are using the irrigation for targeted drug delivery. I would say uh, more than half of the clinical manuscripts that we now have in print or being under peer review demonstrate Iraflow's ability to be used for irrigation with a therapeutic agent like TPA, thrombolytic medication, antibiotics, things of that nature, which further disrupt and accelerate the removal of this toxic material. You don't have to wait on the body to break it down. You're actually helping get it out by delivering small doses of drugs that typically would struggle to cross the blood-brain barrier. And so outcome-wise, has it? have you guys seen a market? It's got to be a huge improvement, but what, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. It's reduction of complications and reduced length of stay. Uh, those are the key elements. You know, you're getting out more blood doing it without the complications, which allows the patient to get out of the ICU faster or even get out of the ICU at all. So our, our clinical data thus far uh, shows a marked reduction in length of stay. For chronic subdural hematomas, the national average is a, a five to six day treatment uh, with ear flow. Uh, we're seeing on average patients get out of the hospital in two to three days, so about a 50% reduction. For intraventricular hemorrhage, depending upon the amount of blood and the severity of that, that bleed. That can be anywhere from a, a seven day to a, a 21 day it was path for a, a patient in the intensive care unit. And at six months, only 20% of those patients can live independently after suffering that type of stroke. You know, at the, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons meeting in San Francisco back in October, we had a poster presented that showed case series that, that it showed that we were able to get 90% of the blood out within 72 hours using a combination of uh, Iraflow's irrigation and a thrombolytic medication. So, you know, all of that, while all of our clinical manuscripts to date have shown a 0% catheter occlusion rate when the irrigation has been employed. So, you know, we're a small company that's heavily investing in clinical data, and, and every step of the way, that clinical data is confirming that the irrigation helps to do each of the things it's intended for. Yeah. That's one of the things that I always admired about the kind of the, the strategy you and Anthony and the rest of your team have employed over there is you guys really took a step back when you step, stood in, st stepped into this role. You took a step back and you really looked at it and you said, we can't approach this like we've done in the past with atherectomy or vascular catheters. This is a this is a very data-driven market. It's a very U.S. data-driven market. And you guys, to use your term, I remember standing there over the device in your office when we first met and you said, we're going to walk before we run. And you really built that clinical story over time. And I think that's commendable, but it's also why you guys are seeing some such significant success in the marketplace is because you, you know, it's, it, it, you know, these devices cross specialty. They're not, one strategy does not fit all for sure. Can you t talk to a little bit about the, the digital component of the device? What's the digital component of the device today? And then, you know, we've talked a little bit in the past and I don't know how comfortable you are getting into it, but you know, what, Iraflow 2.0, what are you going to do with that data? What's the future look like? The entire premise here is taking an analog 
manually intensive standard of care where the nurse has to come in every single hour, do everything by hand, and read and, and react accordingly to something that brings a digital uh, intelligent approach. And so with Earflow, we, we have a small piece of capital equipment. You can see an earlier generation of it up here on my shelf in my office. This has an iPhone-like user interface uh, that will tell the nurse each and every second uh, what's going on with the patient. The system will go through a cycle where it'll irrigate, it'll read the patient's intracranial pressure, and then it'll drain excess fluid. And each step of the way, uh, it will talk to the, uh, the nurse about what's going on, about the measurements that are being read, and, and what exactly is happening. And then behind the scenes, the system is documenting all of the measurements in terms of intracranial pressure, in terms of irrigation rates, and is storing that information behind the scenes. So throughout patient treatment or upon completion of patient treatment, those data points can be extracted. Uh, they can have a minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of uh, the patient's condition throughout the entire treatment. And then over time, our goal is to, to begin to consolidate all of those millions and millions of data points to uh, use artificial intelligence uh, to start to, to refine and optimize treatment paradigms. Uh, more systems out there, more patients being treated, more data points that can be extrapolated into meaningful changes. Insights. Yeah, exactly. The data tells the story, and that's what we're trying to do is bring a data-driven, intelligent approach to the sickest patients in the ICU. So, yeah, so you take the data, you're collecting the data, then you build the AI software, and then sure. you, you feed it the data, and then that gets more intelligent as it gets more data, and then eventually you're able to tailor that approach more specific to that patient. Absolutely. Yeah, versus the physician having to say, okay, I want it to bullish this time and in these intervals and whatnot, the machine will, will do the learning for the physician. Continuing to make the system more intelligent, understanding how the patient and the patient's brain reacts uh, at various irrigation rates, at various points in the treatment, all those things can give us critical data points on, on how this care should evolve over time. This is an interesting question. I get, when I recruit for you guys, I get asked this a lot, mm -hmm. which is a compliment to you, you guys and the device. And from day one, I've looked at this and I said, it, I don't think you guys hear from physicians a ton of like clinical pushback. People don't say to you guys, we think this is voodoo. We don't think this works. Why is every hospital in America not using this? That's a little bit of hyperbole, but what's the biggest challenge you guys face when installing this product into an account? First of all, you're right. Airflow is the easiest thing that, that I've ever had a chance to talk to a, a physician about because it makes sense. There's nothing the system does that they're not already doing, but in a manual way, combines it all into a, an automated approach. The clinical pushback is not there. The pushback's a handful of things. One, still early stage. Conceptually, it makes sense. Show me the clinical data to prove it. And now we, we've got 15 or so peer-reviewed manuscripts and the interim analysis on our first prospective comparative trials should be out early next year. Very excited to show the, the impact and, and prove it in well-rounded clinical data, even more so than we have. And then from that point forward, it's really two reasons. One, we're a small company. We spend the same on our commercial team now than we did before the pandemic. We've been very judicious with our investments over the past couple of years, because you never know when your team's not going to be able to step foot into an ICU again. And so there's just still a, a, a rudimentary awareness of who we are and what we're trying to do. And as more thought leading physicians use the system, that's changing on a daily basis. You know, now the conversations we have at key conferences is exponentially different than the conversation we had three years ago. It's gone from who are you and what is this to, oh yeah, we've talked about this before, that's phenomenal clinical data. That, that helps tremendously. And then probably in this day and age, the number one pushback on any medical device is navigating your way through the value analysis process getting approval inside of a hospital. We have intelligent digital next generation technology that is more expensive upfront than the dated technology they use, but saves significant money on the back end uh, with reduction of complications and reduced length of stay. But you, you have to prove that to the hospital, not just with your own clinical data, but with their experience. Right. 
You have to have very direct conversations to answer the questions of the purchasing departments. You know, even bring in the all the way up to the CFO in certain situations to prove that this is an investment the hospital needs to to make. And as a small company, you get better and better at telling that story and having supporting documentation with each passing day. Yeah, the economic story is always the, the elephant in the middle of every room, right? But the good thing is what you guys have going for you as i see it is these are problems that they're already talking about yeah they know that these are huge issues they they, you don't have to go in and calculate what it costs them to keep a patient an extra day in the icu they already know that and so you just have to walk them down the logical path of here's how we can avoid that and that just like you said that story it it builds over time with every startup and you know that question is in no way to discredit the growth that you guys have already had because you guys have had tremendous growth and and we're seeing social proof of that which we'll get into in a second but neurosurgeons specifically like if there's any specialty and in any application that people or that physicians are going to be cautious it's removing blood from the brain. Absolutely. They measure twice, measure three times and cut once on that. So w- without a doubt. And the way I look at it, Mike, is if, you, if you've seen the, the so-called Rogers curve of, of a innovation adoption, on the left side of the curve, you've got your early adopters, you've got your innovators, you know, the, the folks who sleep outside of the Apple store waiting for the new iPhone. And then on the far right side of that curve, you, you have the laggards. No matter how cool a new toy is, they're, they're going to stick with what they've had. They change when the hospital makes them. Absolutely. Like my mom trying to figure out how to use her iPhone at this point, you know, only, only because she has to. Because she wants to be able to get pictures of her grandkids. Absolutely. Don't, <laughs> don't ever expect me to explain to her how the cloud works and how that picture shows up, but it just shows up. It shows up. We've spent most of our time over the last three years, obviously focusing on those innovators and and early adopters. Now, the world of neurosurgery is not filled with innovators and early adopters for obvious reasons. They want the clinical data. They want to know who's using the system. They want to see uh, success with some of their peers before they're willing to, to tackle a new paradigm. It's markedly different than something you might see in the cath lab. You know, I would say as a, as a whole, uh, interventional cardiologist, because they've been shown and brought so many new toys that have just revolutionized care over the last couple of decades, you have a significantly higher percentage of early adopters and innovators in the world of something like interventional cardiology. In the neuro ICU, where the innovation hasn't been there, they walk with a little more trepidation and skepticism, and it's on us as a company to address those concerns, and that's really where we've been investing and in, in focusing our efforts. Yeah, and you know, I think I think there's a there's an inherent difference too, and I don't know if you want to call it opportunity cost or whatnot, but you know, if a, if a physician says I'm going to use this uh, atherectomy catheter, I'm gonna try this atherectomy catheter today. The opportunity cost of not using the other one that he's comfortable with isn't all that significant. He can try it if he doesn't like it, he can throw it away and pull the other one that he's, he's, he's comfortable using and continue on with the case. Probably not a huge, you know, the, the patient, the, the risk to the patient is probably significantly lower. The baked in risk of a physician in, in these applications, trying something new is, it's just greater. It's a bigger conceptually that you have to ask that physician to make. The good thing is, I always say with products like these is once you do get them to convert, you know, it's like heart valves. You know, yeah. people used to joke heart valves. You know, a cardiac surgeon, they'd change their wife before they change their heart valve, right? And it's a, it's a similar analogy. The other thing I would say in a single use interventional tool, you know, something, you know, a stent or an atherectomy device or even a, a heart valve, you've got to make one person happy for the most part. You, you got to make sure that the neuroradiologist or the interventional cardiologist or the vascular surgeon likes your tool and they like the outcomes that they see on the screen immediately. That patient gets off the table, uh, recovers and, and goes home in a relatively short period of time. The biggest eye opener, this is why I've loved learning this new space. The neuro ICU is an unbelievably democratic place. The neurosurgeon performs a surgery. The neurosurgeon will round on the patient each day. The neurosurgeon has ownership for the patient. But 90 plus percent of your involvement is not with that neurosurgeon. It's with the neurocritical nursing team. Uh, It's with the hospitalist or the neurointensivist who is 
watching and, and treating that patient in the intensive care unit. So you know, it's not just selling the neurosurgeon to drive the product through product approval. You know, if the residents, the nurses, and the intensivists aren't on board for the other 23 and a half hours during the day, then you're not going to have the adoption. And we have to sell and convince and support each of those people throughout the process in order to make sure that Iraflow can provide the best care possible. Yeah, democratization is a good term for it. Yeah. And I want to be sensitive to time here and get you back to your your day, but I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to talk about the exciting new announcement you guys had. I think it was late last week or early this week. Uh, you guys formed a recent partnership with, with Medtronic. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. We're still in the early stages, but I mentioned earlier in our conversation the fact that you know, the awareness of, of our company, the awareness of our airflow system and our commercial feet on the streets really haven't changed much since the beginning of the pandemic. You know, we went from a exponential acceleration phase into a survive and advance phase like many early stage companies over the last couple of years. And we have a couple of years of ground to make up in order to uh, achieve the, the lofty goals that we set for ourselves. Uh, and so we had the opportunity to enter into a, a commercial partnership uh, with Medtronic, world's largest medical device company uh, who has a meaningful presence in the world of neurosurgery, uh, a leading presence in neurosurgery, uh, as well as the, the neurointensive care unit. And we're going to start with a number of their territories here in the U.S. where their sales professionals uh, will be able to, to promote Iraflow on our behalf. Our team will, will support them, uh, will help with the training, will help with the patient treatment support. And we'll watch this uh, initial pilot phase closely with hopes, I think, in both directions of continuing to expand to uh, a larger geographic footprint and more of their territories uh, when things come together as planned. So it's, it really has been a transformational thing for us as a company and to have the validation of our technology, our clinical data, and our physician feedback from a company like Medtronic just completely justifies uh, the hard work that's gone in over the last couple of years and, and sets us on a new path towards market leadership. In reality, would have taken a significantly longer period of time just doing it on our own. Uh, so we're very excited about the, the partnership that we're, we're starting to build with our friends at Medtronic. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of social proof. The proof is always in the pudding, as they say, to have entity like that take notice in what you guys are doing, take a step back and say, hey, there's something here. Uh, speaks volumes to what you guys have accomplished thus far and also I think is is encouraging that the horizon is extremely bright over there. I want to get you out of here, buddy, and back to your day. I can't thank you enough for joining the show. I'm a huge fan, like I said, of, of the technology of the company, uh, but also of, of you in general. I, I don't say this lightly. If anybody out there listening ever has an opportunity to work with, well, literally hundreds of people that have worked for you, and, and every single one of them has had nothing but glowing remarks. So if you ever have an opportunity to work with Will, uh, I would jump at the chance. And I appreciate the partnership that you've had with us over the years and look forward to watching what you do moving forward and, and uh, really appreciate you coming on and again as a guest. Pleasure's all mine, Mike. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier you know, the impact that you've had in helping to build many of those relationships that you just referenced. Uh, you, you have a small growing company. The one thing you can never compromise is culture and, and doing it the right way, building it from scratch with the right level of family values where everyone's really vested. That's what gets you to a point where a partnership with someone like Medtronic is possible. It's, it's why I do what I do. It's the relationships and, and the partnership with uh, with you over the years has, has played a key role in that. So anytime I uh, get a chance to catch up with you, uh, it's really enjoyable. So I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, folks, that's it for uh, this edition of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. Uh, appreciate you tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode.